and led endeavor that is done at the request of the Malian government, and I think that's well underway now. That's General Carter Ham, commander of the U.S. Africa Command. Here are headlines in the papers this morning. Above the fold in the Wall Street Journal, U.S. to expand role in Africa. Military pact with Niger brings American forces closer to conflict in Mali. And then we also see the New York Times and the Washington Post. New York Times says the U.S. is weighing a base for spy drones in North Africa. The Washington Post says the U.S. seeks a new drone base to bolster spying in Africa. Uh, what's the significance? Well, uh, the significance is the dedication now of resources. We recognize the threat, and I give the administration, uh, the Defense Department, the agencies credit for recognizing the threat and now moving to secure the intelligence. We cannot operate in the blind or, op or a reflexively. We need that intelligence that can be supplied uh, in real time, and then ultimately, perhaps other options are on the table. So it's, I think, a good move. Niger, by the way, has been a country, one of the few countries in the region that has taken this threat seriously from the beginning. They've been very forceful advocates for containment and pushing back on the extremists. They know firsthand, being on the front lines, what that means. Uh, and so they've been very committed to it. And they've one of the few African countries that's actually honored its commitment to supply troops to this operation in Mali. So. Uh, the details of the, agree the agreements that uh, have been reported for basing Niger have not been released, but I think once they are, I think we'll find that it's a very good step in better positioning ourselves to deal with the threat. Let's hear from Charles in Anniston, Alabama, Democrats line. Hi, Charles. Hi, uh, I love C-SPAN, and thank you for uh, doing what you do and not being so biased on the subjects. Uh, uh, back co my uh, comment and question, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, yeah, Osama bin Laden, you know, we got him back in May of 2011, right? And uh, okay, so so he was banished from, uh, I think, Saudi Arabia and and uh, given statehood or protection and and one of the North African countries uh, back in the you know 90s. Then he, he was supposedly moved to Afghanistan and started living like a like their prophets, like the Muslims uh, believe their prophets do uh, in jihadist fashion. Okay, so what country was it? That gave him statehood or protection uh, in North Africa, and also I would like you to comment, sir, on uh, Northern Darfur and how it's a possibility that some of the some of the people in Northern Darfur who were committing genocide and other forms of physical and psychological warfare, maybe the possibility of them moving over into uh, Malai, and uh, I would like to uh, have your comments on that, please. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Well, uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, the answer to your question very quickly was it was Sudan, which uh, in the 1990s gave shelter to Osama bin Laden. And that was one of the reasons uh, cited, of course, for why uh, when President Clinton launched a missile attack on Sudan. Uh, now, your comment actually is a very good one about the question of whether uh, fighters from Darfur, perhaps some of those who've been involved in what's been described as the genocide there, are possibly moving to join the fight in northern Mali. Uh, we have credible reports in recent months of fighters from throughout Africa, including uh, Sharawis from the so-called refugee camps in southern Algeria, who, those who oppose Morocco's uh, claims to the Western Sahara, to actually people, fighters from Darfur and Sudanese fighters, uh, as well as some from Nigeria and other African countries joining. And we also have people from farther afield. So this area of northern Mali really had become a magnet for uh, fighters from throughout not only Africa and the Middle East, but beyond. And it was growing as such. And I think that's the threat perception that uh, led a number of leaders, including the French president, to decide to intervene. Richmond, Virginia. John's up next, Independent Line. Hi, John. Uh, thank you for taking my call. A uh, quick comment and question. Um, I, I don't think the African Union truly understands how bad this is for Africa that foreigners keep getting involved on the continent. This is not just a, a declaration of war in one country. This is a declaration of war on the entire continent, and they need to they need to stop this. They need to stop the French from being able to come in to a country on the continent. They need to stop. NATO from coming in to countries on the continent, this is bad. Europe wouldn't allow other uh, foreigners to do this to Europe. Why would the Africans allow this? They need to take care of problems on their own continent and not allow foreigners who have colonized them 
and enslaved us in the past to do this. These are our enemies. That's number one. What is the French's true motive for coming into Mali? Because it's certainly not because they care. These are our former colonial masters. These are people that enslaved us. These are our enemies. What is, our, what is the reason they've come in? Because it's certainly not because they care. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we're, we're in agree agreement, uh, John, that most people, in fact, the, the U.S. administration, the State Department, uh, as noted uh, uh, in the statement that Libby read, General Ham, in the comment you heard in the segment uh, earlier, everyone would like this to be an African-led uh, solution. Really, it's the only way to go ahead. Unfortunately, uh, although many of the African countries talk a great deal about getting involved, with the exception of a few, uh, Niger, I mentioned earlier, Morocco has been on the lead on also raising awareness on this issue for some time. Uh, and ironically, Mali, a uh, year and a half ago, I hosted the then Malian uh, foreign minister here in Washington where he was appealing and warning about what was coming. Uh, but unfortunately, many African countries still haven't developed the political will to grasp with their own problems. The African sub-regional community, the ECOWAS, Economic Community of West African States, put together a program, a plan before the French intervention to send 3,300 troops eventually to deal with this issue. Well, 3,300 poorly equipped troops not speaking all the same language from English-speaking countries, French-speaking countries, to reconquer and secure an area the size of France, the size of Texas, that's delusional. Uh, it's not realistic. It's actually, it's not fair to the soldiers being sent because they'd be sent to be swallowed whole by the desert uh, and the extremists out there. So until the African Union, the sub-regional organizations develop the political will and the capacity to handle these challenges, what will end up happening is the states most affected, the countries most directly threatened, will appeal as Mali, as Niger, and others have asked for outside help to deal with it because unfortunately their neighbors aren't coming to their aid. Peter Baum is the director of the Michael S. Ansari Africa Center at the Atlantic Council. His prior positions include serving as senior vice president at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and editor of the bi-monthly journal, American Foreign Policy Interests. He was also on the senior advisory group of the U.S. Africa Command since its creation and was VP for the Association for the Study of the Middle East and Africa. Let's listen more to General Ham, commander of U.S. Africa Command at Howard University last week. Our mission is to protect America, Americans, and American interests from threats that may emerge from the continent of Africa. And we see this manifest itself in Somalia with al-Shabaab, uh, in, the, in the Maghreb and the Sahel, as playing out now in, in Mali with al-Qaeda in the, in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb, Ansar al-Din, and, and other organizations, uh, shifting a bit further south into, into Nigeria, the existence of, uh, of Boko Haram, organizations that are all focused on undermining the, the, the governance of those countries and establishing uh, uh, their, their own uh, regime of control outside of legitimate government control. While I'm very concerned about each of those individual entities, Al-Shabaab, AQIM, Ansar al-Din, Boko Haram, it is increasingly the, the coordination the synchronization of efforts of those different organizations, that is of concern to me. We're starting to see uh, uh, increasing collaboration, sharing of funding, uh, sharing recruiting efforts, sharing of weapons and explosives, uh, and certainly a sharing of ideology that is expanding uh, and connecting these various organizations. General Carter Ham, head of U.S. Africa Command. Uh, Peter Fahm, Jonathan Broder reports in CQ Weekly about this uh, emerging threat in Africa, and he writes this, despite being in existence since 2007, the Africa Command has fewer than 2,000 troops at its disposal and is still based in Europe. Well, I think uh, two points. One is uh, on the resources available for U.S. Africa Command, and the other is the basing issue. I think they're two separate ones. Certainly, I think uh, with the gr growing recognition of threats that are very real to the United States, to U.S. interests, to American citizens, and as well as our allies in Africa, I think hopefully, uh, despite the fiscal constraints under which we all labor uh, 
here in Washington, there will be greater resources necessary to fully staff out the, uh, the command. As far as basing, I think you, for now, I think Europe is the best base for the command uh, for several reasons. One is African countries are very sensitive about their sovereignty. Uh, their independence is relatively recent. Secondly, it's a question of infrastructure. There are very few, if any, African countries where you could put down a U.S. combatant command, even assuming a willing host, where the presence of that many Americans wouldn't disproportionately impact the city uh, in question, its infrastructure and its ability to support that. And then there's the connections between. Unfortunately, Africa's infrastructure for transport is still developing and to move from one part of Africa to another, oftentimes in my own travels, I have to return to Europe and come back down. So in many ways, you save a leg on the journey just by being offshore, so to speak. Shane is our next caller in Kings Park, New York, on the Democrats' line, talking with Peter Fahm. Good morning, Shane. Hi, good morning. Um, Without objection, so ordered. Madam President, on January the 29th in 2009, President Obama signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. It was a proud day, and I was there for that. The critical law, the first legislation signed into law by President Obama after his first election, reversed the outrageous Supreme Court decision in Ledbetter versus Goodyear and made clear that a worker like Lilly Ledbetter, who does not earn a that does not learn of her pay inequities for years still had recourse to challenge her wage discrimination. Today we celebrate the anniversary of the enactment of this important law, but at the same time we must recognize it was only a first step. We need to do much more to ensure that all workers in our society are paid fairly for their work and are not shortchanged because of their gender, race, or other personal characteristic. That is why Four years after enactment of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, I am proud to introduce once again the Fair Pay Act, a bill I have introduced in every Congress since 1996. Now let me get some background here. In 1963, Congress enacted the Equal Pay Act to end unfair discrimination against women in the workforce. At that time, 25 million female workers earned just 60% of the average pay for men. Now, while we've made progress toward the goal of true pay equity fully a half century later, too many women still do not get paid what men do for the same or nearly the same work. Let's be clear about it. The Equal Pay Act of 1963 has to do with women doing the same jobs as men. Same jobs as men. But still, on average, as we know, a for every dollar a full-time male worker earns, a woman earns just 77 cents. So we've gone from 60 cents in all those 60 years to 77 cents for every dollar that a man makes. What that really translates into, you might say, well, okay, 77 cents, is that a big deal? Yes, it is. Over a lifetime of work, it means an average of $400,000 in a lifetime that a woman loses because of unequal pay practices. Now, I'll say this again later on, but that $400,000 is not just the pay she loses during her lifetime. Think about the retirement benefits that that woman loses because she's been underpaid all those years. So that's why you have a system in America today. Woman retires, man retires, they've had the same kind of work. Man gets a lot more retirement than a woman because they paid in more, because they were paid more during their lifetimes. So this system is wrong, it's unjust, it threatens the economic security of our families. The fact is millions of American families are dependent on a woman's paycheck just to get by, to put food on the table, to pay for child care, deal with rising health care costs. In today's economy, few families have a stay-at-home mother. In fact, 71% of mothers today are in the labor force. They are major contributors to their family's income. Two-thirds of mothers bring home at least a quarter of their family's earning. In more than four of ten families with children, a woman is the majority or sole breadwinner. That means in today's economy, when a mother earns less than her male colleagues, her family, her family must sacrifice basic necessities as well as facing greater difficulty for these kids to save for college, affording a home, living the American dream. 
and the lifetime of earnings, earning losses that all women face, including those women without children or whose children are growing up, affects not only their well-being during their working lives, but as I said earlier, their ability to save and have a decent retirement. Now, the evidence shows that discrimination accounts for much of the pay gap. In fact, according to one study, when you look at all of the reasons that there is a wage gap, well, we have race 2.4 percent, 3.5 percent, union status, labor force experience, industry category, occupational, 41 percent unexplained. They can't explain why it is. Well, the fact is that's because of discrimination. It's because our laws have not done enough to prevent this discrimination from occurring. That's why the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was a critical first step. And that's why it's important to, pay the, uh, to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act. Now that bill was introduced last week by Senator Mikulski. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor. She has always championed that. Now what that does is it starts to close a lot of the loopholes and barriers to effective enforcement in our existing laws to close that 41 percent unexplained gap. We need to strengthen penalties and give women the tools they need to confront discrimination. Madam President, it's outrageous that the Senate has not yet passed the Paycheck Fairness Act. In the last two Congresses, this bill got more than a majority support. In 2010, 58 United States Senators, a large majority, voted to pass this legislation. So if we got 58 votes, then why didn't we get it? Because of Republican obstructionism, we couldn't even proceed to debate the bill. So this was a filibuster on a motion to proceed to the bill. We got 58 votes, but we couldn't even debate it. Now, since we just went through a recent debate on rules reform, I want the American people to understand this. The Republicans, the minority party, have continuously prevented the United States Senate from even considering the issue of unequal wages and gender discrimination. Millions of women and their families are concerned about the fact they get paid less than their male colleagues. It's unfair. It's unjust. Nevertheless, repeatedly, the Republicans have filibustered even debating the issue. Well, now, Madam President, just last week, we had a vote on the Senate to change some rules. So we made some modifications of the rules, and I truly hope that those modifications that were made will now enable us to get over this hurdle, to bring up the Paycheck Fairness Act, debate it. If they want to offer amendments, that's fine. But let's debate it. Let's have amendments, and then let's vote to pass the bill. So I hope that these changes in the rules uh, last week will enable us to do so. Now again, Madam President, as I said, the Lilly Ledbetter uh, bill was a first step. The Paycheck Fairness Act will start to close some of the loopholes and make sure that we have the penalties will be enforced. But there's one more step that needs to be taken. And I think it is the most critical one of all. Equal pay? Yes. We've had that since 63. That's women and men doing the same job. Lily Ledbetter Act, saying that you can go back and get those back wages uh, that you were due. But that's sort of after the fact. Paycheck Fairness Act, yes. Increase, make sure we have penalties and enforceability. But there's one other huge, huge, glaring discrimination ongoing in our society today against women. And that is, as a nation, we unjustly devalue jobs traditionally performed by women, even when they require comparable skills to the jobs traditionally performed by men. Today, millions of what we call female-dominated jobs, for example, social workers, teachers, child care workers, nurses, 
those who care for our elderly in assisted care living or in nursing homes, mostly women. A lot of these jobs, most of these jobs, are equivalent in skills, effort, responsibility, and working conditions to male-dominated jobs. But the female-dominated jobs pay significantly less. This is unfair and unjust discrimination. Why is a housekeeper worth less than a janitor? A maid. Why is a maid less, worth less than a janitor? 89% of maids are female. 67% of jan janitors are male. Now, while the jobs are equivalent in skills, effort, responsibility, and working conditions, the median weekly earnings for a maid is $387. For a janitor, $463. Computer support workers. A job that is 72% male have median weekly earnings of $949. In contrast, secretaries and administrative assistants, 96% female, have median weekly earnings of $659. So why do we value someone who helps with the computers more than someone who makes the entire office function? And that's not to say that the men are overpaid, it's just to say that Jobs that we have long considered in our country as, quote, women's work, women's jobs, are grossly underpaid. Now, to address this more subtle, deep-rooted discrimination, today I introduced the Fair Pay Act. As I said, a bill I've introduced along with Congresswoman Norton every year since 1996. The bill will ensure that employers provide equal pay for jobs that are equivalent, equivalent in skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions. Madam President, people say, well, how do you do that? Well, we have some history. In 1982, Minnesota, the state of Minnesota in 1982, implemented a pay equity plan for its state and I think also its municipal employees. The state found that women were segregated into historically female-dominated jobs and that women's jobs paid 20% less than male-dominated jobs. Pay equity wage adjustments were phased in over four years, leading to an average pay increase of $200 per month for women in female-dominated jobs. And in my home state of Iowa, in 1983, the Iowa legislature, a Republican legislature and a Republican governor, I might add, passed a bill stipulating that the state shall not discriminate in compensation between predominantly male and female jobs deemed to be of comparable worth. 1983. I'm proud of Iowa. I just wanted to say this was passed by a Republican legislature signed by a Republican governor. Now, towards that end, the state engaged a professional accounting firm to evaluate the value of 800 job classifications in state government. The final recommendations made in April of 1984 proposed that 10,751 employees should be given a pay increase. Implemented in March of 1985, female employees' pay was increased at that time by about 1.5%. But think of what that means from 1985 to now, <laughs> and how much more those women are paid over all those years. So it can be done. For the women in this country who are currently being paid less, not because of their skills or education, but simply because they are in undervalued, quote, female jobs, making sure they receive their real worth would make a huge difference for them and the families that rely on their wages. And again, many of these jobs are jobs that we don't know what we'd do without them. You ever visit someone in your family who's in a nursing home? Who's taking care of those people? It's women. You take someone who's in a situation like that and they have to move heavy people and lift them up and they've got to be strong and they, do a, they care for people. And then you look at truck drivers. Most truck drivers are men. You know, you, truck drivers today, you know, they have power steering and power brakes. And they got all of, You don't have to be strong to drive a truck. They're making 
a lot more money than that woman who is working in that nursing home taking care of your grandparents. Why? Skills, effort, responsibility, working conditions? About the same. What my bill would do would be very simple. It would require employers to publicly disclose their job categories and their pay scales. Got it? Employers would publicly disclose their job categories and their pay scales without requiring specific information on individual employees. I'm not asking anyone to say what they're paying an individual employee. We just want to know job categories and pay scales. If we give women information about what their male colleagues are earning, they can insist on a better deal for themselves in the workplace. Right now, women who believe they are the victim of pay discrimination must file a lawsuit, endure a drawn-out legal discovery process to find out whether they make less than the man working beside them. With pay statistics readily available, this process could be avoided. In fact, Madam President, I remember when Lily Ledbetter first testified before our committee, the committee I now chair, and the committee that the distinguished occupant of the chair is proud to serve on now. So when Lily Ledbetter first appeared before our committee, I asked her. Now, I had provided her information on the Fair Pay Act, the one I'm talking about. And I asked her, I said, if the Fair Pay Act had been law, would it have averted her wage discrimination case? She made it very clear that had she had the information about pay scales that our bill provides, this would have given her the information she needed to insist on being paid a fair salary from the beginning, rather than having to resort to litigation years after the discrimination began. Mr. President, Madam President, four years after President Obama signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, let's make sure that what happened to Lilly never happens again. By recommitting ourselves to eliminating discrimination in the workplace and making equal pay for equivalent work, equal pay for equivalent work, a reality. So I've introduced this bill to every Congress since 1996. We get focused on Lily that better, yes, that's important. We're focused on paycheck fairness, yes. But think about the millions of American women out there who are in these traditional women's jobs that require skill, effort, responsibility working conditions that are similar to a man, and yet they are grossly underpaid. If Minnesota and Iowa, and there may be some other states that I don't know about, I just happen to know about those two, but if they can do it, and they did this in the 1980s for state employees, municipal employees in Minnesota, surely we can do this nationwide. If you really want to stop discrimination in pay in this country between women and men, the Fair Pay Act is the one that will do it. Uh, so I'm going to continue to push it for as long as I'm here, and hopefully we can have some hearings on it again, which I will, and hopefully we can begin to move that. Madam President, I ask an absent consent that Ben Smitten and Rich Vickers of my staff be granted four privileges for the duration of today's session. Without objection. Madam President, on what is perhaps, well, I guess not perhaps, I guess we just voted, on what is her final day as Secretary of State, I would like to express my admiration and my gratitude to Hillary Rodham Clinton for the extraordinary job that she has done over the last four years. I agree wholeheartedly with President Obama, who said that she has been one of the finest Secretaries of State in our nation's history. When she took on this responsibility in January of 2009, Hillary Clinton was already one of the most celebrated and accomplished women in the world. Certainly her reputation and renown have been tremendous assets as she worked to restore America's standing in the world. But over the last four years, Hillary Clinton has been the ultimate workhorse public servant as opposed to the show horse. Now this comes as no surprise to me and 
two other former colleagues here in the Senate. We know that she is a leader of extraordinary substance and talent with an amazing work ethic. Secretary of State Clinton has set records as the most traveled secretary for time in office, visiting some 42 countries just in the last year alone. And she will be remembered for her tireless efforts to promote the empowerment of women worldwide and for her many demonstrations that smart power and assertive diplomacy can be far more effective than so-called hard power and military interventions. I'm especially grateful to Secretary of State Clinton for insisting on robust assistance to Haiti in the wake of the devastating earthquake of 2010. In addition, following my visit to Vietnam in 2010 and just prior to her own visit, we talked and I had urged her to pledge America's commitment to helping Vietnam in cleaning up the sites contaminated by Agent Orange. She agreed wholeheartedly and this is just one way she has been very successful in repairing the breach with our former adversary and doing what is right and just for the victims of Agent Orange in Vietnam. Madam President, I have many fond memories of Hillary Clinton's eight years here in the United States Senate. During that entire tenure, we served together on the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. In that role, as in her previous role as First Lady, she was an outspoken advocate for health care reform, fighting tirelessly to secure quality, affordable health coverage for all Americans. Though she was no longer in the Senate when the Affordable Care Act passed and was signed into law, she shares enormous credit for laying the groundwork for that historic achievement. Madam President, Hillary Clinton has been a wonderful friend to my wife Ruth and to me, and of course, from her many campaigns in my state, she has so many friends all across the state of Iowa. So she is retiring from the Department of State, but we all know that by no means is she a retiring person. There are many vivid chapters yet to be written in the story of Hillary Rodham Clinton. I wish her a richly deserved rest, much success and happiness in the years ahead. And Madam President, as we say goodbye to Secretary Clinton, and in that capacity as Secretary of State, we say welcome aboard and congratulations to my good friend, Senator John Kerry, on the resounding confirmation of his nomination to serve as our next Secretary of State. His departure will be a tremendous loss to the Senate, but I respect President Obama's decision to tap him for this absolutely critical position. There is nobody nobody in the United States better qualified by experience, knowledge, and temperament to step into this extraordinarily demanding job. Now to repeat what my colleagues already know, but it always bears repeating, after volunteering to serve in the United States Navy during the Vietnam War, John Kerry was awarded a Silver Star, a Bronze Star, and three Purple Hearts. Upon returning home, he became a national leader in the fight for justice for veterans who served beside him in Vietnam, as well as for veterans of wars before and since Vietnam. He joined with others to found the Vietnam Veterans of America organization. He has worked hard here in the Senate over all these years to secure veterans benefits for an extension of the GI Bill of Rights for higher education, for appropriate treatment for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. As we all know, Senator Kerry has played a leading role in shaping American foreign policy for many years in his position on the Foreign Relations Committee and as chair of that distinguished committee. As chair of that, he was instrumental in securing passage of the New START Treaty, a vital arms control accord with Russia that is helping to reduce the danger of nuclear proliferation. He has served as a trusted special envoy to Afghanistan, Sudan, and Pakistan at crucial moments. Senator Kerry advocated for democratic elections in the Philippines. He was part of the delegation that uncovered the fraud that ultimately led to the removal of President Ferdinand Marcos. He was a strong proponent of U.S. action to end ethnic cleaning, cleansing in Kosovo and to impose sanctions on Burma tied to human rights abuses. Senator Kerry has been a leader in promoting economic development and recovery in Haiti, fighting global HIV-AIDS, 
supporting democracy and human dignity, poverty assistance, and the advancement of women's empowerment throughout the world. In his early days in the Senate, Senator Kerry and I, in fact, we were elected together in 1984. We came to the Senate together. But right after that, shortly after that, Senator Kerry and I went on a fact-finding mission to Nicaragua and unearthed information regarding the activities of the Contra guerrillas, which he presented to the Committee on Foreign Relations. Based in part on his groundbreaking findings, the committee launched an investigation into the funding of the Contra guerrillas that ultimately uncovered the Reagan administration's Iran-Contra scandal, a scheme to divert profits from illegal arms sales to Iran to support the Contra guerrillas. Madam President, Senator Kerry and I said, as, uh, Senator Kerry and I, as I said, were both members of the class of 1984 here in the Senate. We worked together to end the illegal support for the Contras in Nicaragua, and we have collaborated on a range of human rights issues since then. In particular, in particular, I salute his tireless and valiant attempt last year to pass the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Madam President, I can't tell you how hard he worked on that. To get it through the committee, and before that, working with others to make sure that we had a good convention through the UN that mirrored our own Americans with Disabilities Act. John Kerry worked tirelessly on this, and I'm deeply grateful for all of that work and the passionate commitment that he made to this treaty. I know that he shares my disappointment that the Senate failed to give its consent to this treaty. But I look forward to working with him in his new role as Secretary of State and with Senator Menendez, our new chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, not only to promote the convention around the world, which I know Senator Kerry will do in his position as Secretary of State, but to once again bring this convention to the floor of the Senate and this time to prevail and pass it. Madam President, there's no question in my mind that John Kerry will be a great Secretary of State. I wish him and Teresa the very best. Look forward to working with him in the years ahead. Madam President, with that, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
John Kerry was confirmed this afternoon as the next Secretary of State with a vote of 94 to 3. Uh, the three nay votes were Senators Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, both from Texas, and James Inhofe of Oklahoma. Mr. Kerry plans to speak on the Senate floor tomorrow, Senator perhaps his last Senate. time I'll doing that as a senator from Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and then become Secretary of State objection. on Friday. And thank you, Madam President. Um, <laughs> last week, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a plan to prevent the risk of another credit rating downgrade by ensuring that the U.S. will not default on its obligations. The House made the responsible decision to stop playing politics, at least for a while, with our nation's creditworthiness and to prevent self-inflicted harm on our economy. But despite this effort, the House couldn't pass up the opportunity to try, while doing the right thing, to score at least one political point. We're now considering the measure they passed. This legislation, the No Budget, No Pay Act, coming directly off a campaign document, insists that congressional pay be linked with a passage of a budget by April 15th. I'm fine with that, uh, that we do that, and if we don't, we don't get paid. But Let's not forget that the Senate passed something even stronger than a budget for the past two years. We passed the Budget Control Act, which reduced the deficit by $2 trillion. That's $2,000 billion. Despite this, House Republicans have no problem misleading the American people with their language, preventing senior senators from being paid until we pass a budget. Well, Madam President, I don't have a problem with the no budget, no pay, but why stop there? What about no jobs bill, no pay? In 2011, the Senate passed my legislation, bipartisanly co-sponsored with Senator Graham and a number of other Republican senators, Senator Byrd and a bunch of Democrats and a group of Democratic senators, passed my legislation to punish China when it cheats, when it manipulates its currency. The bill could create more than two million jobs, mostly in manufacturing. We know what would have happened in places like the presiding officer state of Massachusetts and my state of Ohio with lost manufacturing jobs. Despite the clear evidence that level of the, leveling the playing field on current stopping currency manipulation would create jobs, despite the clear evidence of an overwhelming vote in the Senate and two years ago an overwhelming vote in the House on the same issue, this legislation has languished in the House for the past two years. But why stop at the budget? Why not a no farm bill, no pay legislation? Congress is obligated to pass a farm bill every five years. The Senate passed our bipartisan farm bill, which, among other things, saved some $20 billion, um, direct savings by eliminating the, the, the long-time discredited, the long-time discredited direct payment program. It would save $20 billion, but again, the House refused to act. What about my legislation linking the age at which members of Congress can collect their pensions to the age at which working Americans are eligible for Social Security? Some people in this body, especially in the House of Representatives, want to raise the retirement age for Social Security, yet for themselves, ourselves, if we retire earlier, collect our pensions before that age. If we're going to raise, if people are here are going to raise the eligibility age for Social Security, nobody here should be able to, to collect any retirement benefits until that same age. Citizens in my home state of Ohio and places like Middletown, where workers have watched paper factories get priced out of the market because of unfair competition with countries like China, in places like Cincinnati, where call center workers are watching their jobs get contracted to the Philippines, in Worcester, Massachusetts, or Worcester, Ohio, too many cases of shutdown plants and moving overseas simply or mostly because of currency, not to mention tax breaks that encourage companies, that allow companies to deduct the cost of moving their plant overseas against their federal tax. Those are the kinds of things that average Americans are waiting for the House of Representatives to act, legislation that will make a real difference in their lives right now. Uh, like I said, I'm fine with the No Budget, No Pay Act. Uh, we, should pa we should pass a budget. We should move forward on that. Uh, we need to raise the debt ceiling and stop playing politics with this. But let's the House of let, let the House of Representatives get moving on the issues that affect everyday Americans. That's all about jobs. That's all about this economic recovery. Uh, Madam President, I suggest the absolute point. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
President. Yes, the Senator from Ohio. I'm asking and sent to the defense of the quorum. Without objection. For the Senate, the letter of resignation of Senator John F. Kerry of Massachusetts, effective Friday, February 1st at 4 p.m. Without objection, the letter is deemed read and spread upon the journal. Madam President, I ask the yes, and sent the Judiciary Committee to be discharged from further consideration of SRES 14 and the Senate proceed to its consideration. The clerk will report. SRES 14, raising awareness and encouraging prevention of stalking by designating January 2013 as National Stalking Awareness Month. That's Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? If not, the committee is discharged and the Senate will proceed. I ask you now, the the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. I ask me and consent, Madam President, the Senate proceed to the, early, to the consideration of SRES 20 submitted earlier today. The clerk will report. SRES 20, designating chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection, the Senate will proceed. I ask you now, Madam President, the resolution be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid on the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. Madam President, I understand there's a bill at the desk. I ask for its first reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the first time. S-177, a bill to repeal the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act of 2010 entirely. I now ask for second reading in order to place the bill on the calendar under the provisions of Rule 14. I object to my own request. Objection having been heard. The bill will receive its second reading on the next legislative day. Madam President, I ask you to consent that Brian Seeley, a Department of Justice detail and Judiciary Committee staff, be given Senate floor privileges for the remainder of calendar year 2013. Without objection. Madam President, I ask you to consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it adjourns until 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, January 30th, 2013, that following the prayer and the pledge, the morning hour be deemed expired, the Journal of Proceedings be approved to date, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. And the Senate proceed to a period of morning business for two hours, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the majority controlling the first hour, the Republicans controlling the final hour. Further, that at 2.30 p.m., Senator Kerry be recognized for up to 30 minutes for the purposes of delivering his farewell address. Without objection. And Madam President, I congratulate the, the presiding officer on becoming the senior senator from Massachusetts in almost record time. Um, Madam President, we hope to com complete consideration of the debt limit legislation for the, before the end of the week. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask it adjourn under the previous order. Senate stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. Senators today confirmed Massachusetts Democratic Senator John Kerry to become the next Secretary of State. As the week continues, work's expected on legislation.